Good afternoon, everyone. Incremental transforms of transactional data models to analytical data models in real, real, near real time. Uh, I just got the feedback a few minutes back that I wasn't creative enough in coming up with the title for this talk, so apologies. And yet, uh, over the next few minutes, we'll definitely talk about data. We are all here for data, correct? But let's just take 30 seconds to one minute to talk about bread. Anyone here who hasn't encountered bread in their life? Stupid question, so yeah, taking it back. Uh, have you noticed that bread itself has different slices? Have you noticed the different slices in bread? Show of hands, no one? There's thick slices, uh, chefs use them for French toast. There's thin slices, they go really well with soups. And then there's medium slices, go very well for sandwiches. How many of you like sandwiches? Good, I have an audience. Awesome. Uh, like all good things in the world, this good thing happened with the team as well. So the team is sitting right here. Uh, it's okay if you want to focus on them, say hi, don't look at me, I'll feel less nervous. Uh, other than this, uh, there were two other influencers. Uh, at that time, both of them were with Uber. I think Prasanna has since moved on, but if you want to go deeper into what I'm going to talk about, uh, there's a very interesting article that they put together, the case for incremental processing, right? So credit where it's due. Uh, moving on. This is a little bit about me. Uh, graduated from Bets Pilani. Prasanna and I were in the same class. Uh, everybody went west. I chose to go east. National University of Singapore, Korea University. And currently I'm at Flipkart focusing on supply chain automation, predictive insights, as well as uh, AI and uh, building data platforms for them, right? So that's a little bit about me. Here's the agenda. We'll spend about eight to 10 minutes as to why did we feel the need for this new paradigm. The next 10 minutes, I'll go really deep into the algorithm. If you have your pillows with you, these 10 minutes are for you. Take out the pillows, go to sleep, that's it. And the last 10 minutes is where I'll try and contrast the approach that we have come up with, with existing approaches. Sounds good? Do you want me to cover anything else? Okay, I'll take that as a no. How many of you know that Flipkart has just launched the grocery category? Whoa, awesome. So here's a brief overview of what goes into the grocery fulfillment journey. When you place an order, what happens behind the scenes, right? Not while placing the order, but once the order is accepted, henceforth. Let's start from the top left corner. Uh, we'll move down to the top, uh, bottom right corner, one by one. Top left corner, when we receive the order, it gets, it gets into a warehouse, right? And in the warehouse, uh, pickers are assigned to an order, right? So these, these are people who are walking around the warehouse, trying to pick your order, put it in a bag, right? Once those orders are packed, they get into a big truck. This big truck, because the warehouse at, is at the outskirts of the city, this big truck brings all of those orders somewhere near the city. And once it's near the city, there's something called as a cross dock. A cross dock is where big orders or pallets from the big truck get into smaller vans, right? And these smaller vans are the ones which come to your doorstep, right? Uh, you can imagine a big truck flying through Bangalore traffic and it tells you why we need smaller vans. And once the smaller vans come, there is a field executive who gets into the van, takes your order, delivers it to your home. So that's a little bit about it. But what's interesting about this and why did this particular use case come to my mind when I wanted to justify incremental processing for you? Let's look at that one by one. Do you realize that there are multiple systems participating in this journey? Yeah, there are multiple systems, right? Um, this is the interesting point. Time to act is what drives latency. And I think Ravi, in his previous talk, uh, touched upon it as well. Let's take a few examples. Uh, let's say so, uh, our operations executive realizes that we are going to need two new vans, or two more vans to deliver orders that day. How long to source a van in Bangalore? Takes about an hour, at the very least, right? So your time to act is an hour. Imagine a national truck. So this truck has to go from Bangalore to Delhi. Sourcing an extra truck takes about six hours. That's your time to act, right? If you're into trading, nanoseconds matter, right? So that's your time to act, nanoseconds. 
And if you start looking at your use cases, that time to act is what is going to drive your latency requirements. In our case, it's primarily 30 minutes more than that because we are in the fulfillment supply chain physical domain, right? There is a physical aspect of this. There are people working. They don't act in seconds. They take minutes. 100% accuracy is assumed. Whenever you present a number to them, they understand, they assume it's 100% accurate. Even if our numbers tell them that one order or one order item is missing, it's not in the truck, they will go hunt the entire warehouse for it. And you know why, because customer first. Your order cannot be incomplete when it comes to you, right? 100% accuracy is expected. Uh, again, business is always asking for least effort. Whenever a new business flow or a category goes live, for example, grocery, which went live a few months back, they expect that business monitoring will be available out of the box. Nobody wants to spend time building a monitoring solution, right? So these were some of the motivations based on which we came up with this paradigm of incremental processing. <clears throat> there were a few other aspects, and we'll go into a little detail here, right? So the systems that I'm describing, they're transactional in nature. And they have these data models behind them, which can be put together in a normalized, in a very directed, deterministic relationships, right? So you know beforehand that there are relationships, you know what those relationships are, and you know how those relationships manifest in the real world. Typically, they have longer life cycles. So grocery being a very tight supply chain, order gets received and delivered maybe in 12 to 24 hours. The regular supply chain, it takes up to two days, maybe more. And when you look at these orders, there are tumbling time windows. For these visibility to become complete, you have to look at a longer time window. You cannot look at a point in time and say, this is what it is, right? Why do we have normalized data models in transactional systems? I know this answer is there with you, and maybe Gokul will cover some of this a little more in this next talk, but here's a very simple example. See, normalization facilitates parallelism. So what happens is that you can have a system which is only responsible for accepting orders, and it can keep doing that. You have another system which is only responsible for assigning pickers to orders, and it can keep, keep doing that. They are happening in parallel, and because their data models are different, they're writing separately, right? And at the same time, there are also relationships. For example, order to picker can be many to many. Many orders can go to many pickers, right? Many orders, sorry, one order can go into many shipments, right? Because there are multiple items in there. Many shipments can go into one van. So there are relationships as well. And this slide is essentially demonstrating that. If you have normalized in the transactional side, why do you even need denormalization? For those of you who come from an analytical, well, that's everyone, right? So you'll realize that denormalization actually helps you with fast writes. Sorry, fast reads, right? When you want to do really uh, deep queries, if you have denormalized data, your query returns faster. It gives you a lot more data in one start, right? So if I were to ask you, tell me all shipments which have a van assigned, tell me all orders which have a van assigned, you'll essentially go through three joins, right? Two joins. You'll join the first entity with the second one, second one with the third one. Imagine if you had this denormalized entity, right? Already available to you. You can just query it once, saying that give me every order which has a van, it'll give you upfront. So that's the benefit of denormalization. And hence, we get into the business of taking normalized data models, which have a very strong uh, application in one part of the world, to a denormalized data model, which have, again, a very strong case in another part of the world, right? So you have transactional data models, you have uh, uh, analytical data models. And notice that there is a small point here. There is a key which is identifying all of this. And this, this key is derived wherever you have a one-to-many relationship, we combine them. So order plus shipment become a key for this denormalized data model. And I'll touch into that a little bit. Uh, this was the motivation. This was the use case which was, uh, uh, which motivated us to come up with this new paradigm. Now I'm going to go into a little bit of the architecture of the solution that we have, and beyond that I'll go into the actual algorithm. So if you want to take out your pillows, now's the time. Uh, there's a continuous replication happening. You have source systems on the left-hand side. Uh, the, you have a relay. Each of those source systems is publishing mutations as they happen. This relay, uh, this relay is then copying these, uh, creating replicas of these systems in a staging area, right? Uh, there is a transform and enrich application which is processing all of these transactional data. 
converting into delta mutations, and we'll come into what those delta mutations are. These delta mutations are applied to a denormalized data model via Q, and all of your visualization happens on top of this. Right? So I'm not going to go into the details of what happens between the denormalized data model and the visualization, and Ravi covered it in a lot more detail. Right? So what happens beyond that was like the focus of the previous talk. So let's stick to this. Right? And there is this whole concept of data quality. And I think there have been three talks in this conference on data quality. We have this whole layer which kind of uh, providing visibility into the freshness, it's providing visibility into the completeness of the data that we have. Here's the algorithm, or rather a flow diagram if I may. Right? Uh, so replicate uh, and each of the steps. So don't worry about uh, each of the steps at this point in time, I'll go one by one, let's start. Replication is simple. Let's take an example. You have MySQL databases on the left-hand side. How do you replicate? They publish bin logs. Listen to those bin logs, apply them on your terminal data store, right? And figure out a way to do that, maybe tungsten. The next step, we'll explain through an example. How do you identify what is the incremental window in which you're processing? Assume that we are at 10.05. Uh, we have this data in our system. So there are three transactional data models, sorry, entities, pick list, shipments, and vans. And at 1010, this is their state, right? So you have two orders, O1, O2. They are mapped to two pickers, P1, P2. And some processing has been done, so you have this denormalized data model, right? Understand that there are no shipments mapped to this order. There are no vans mapped to this order. So they remain blank. Uh, notice the key, because no shipments are mapped, they are O1 null, O2 null, right? Let's move forward. At 1010, five minutes have passed. You get two new entries. You get two new orders, O3, O4. They are mapped to pickers, P1, P2. And guess what, order one has now been packed. So it's in shipments S1 and S2, right? The previous window started at 9.50, ended at 10. The current window will start at, someone? Sorry? 10 to 10, 10. Awesome, you're with me, nobody's sleeping. That's great, so current start, current 10, 10. So you look at the last mutation, which was processed in the previous window, and you look at the last mutation, which is available right now, you just pass them and that becomes your time, temporal time window, right? So then you have your temporal window, which is 10 minutes in this particular case. What do you do next? You identify all mutations that have happened in that 10 minutes, correct? How do you do that? Straightforward, right? Uh, everything that has a uh, timestamp beyond 10, below 10, 10, that becomes your uh, mutation. Here's where it gets interesting. And I'm using standard SQL terminology. Doesn't mean that we're using SQL underneath. Uh, if you can in implement these concepts in any other data store with any other tech, go ahead and do it, right? You go with a left outer join. So you start from your first entity, move to the second entity, third entity, because it's a directed acyclic graph. There is an order to it. There is a relationship to it. You do a uh, left outer join, uh, you get certain data. But guess what, uh, once you do this, and because you are only append, we don't want to update uh, big data, right? When you do left outer join, you'll end up with O1, S1 blank, you will miss out the picker because the P1, P2 mapping happened in the previous time window, right? So when you do this, uh, you need to do an inner join. And here's where it gets interesting. I'm going to make another important point about the tech behind this, right? Left outer join, straightforward. But when you're doing inner joins, the data store where this data is going to be persisted and you're going to query needs to support secondary indexes. Does that make sense? Why does it need to support secondary indexes? Because your inner join can happen on different keys. If you have just one primary index, it may not support all possible cases. If you do this, you end up with something like this. So the first two gray rows were what happened in 9.50 to 10 time window. All the bold rows is what has happened in the 10 to 10, 10 time window. And this has been updated at the third column, which is time, right? Make sense so far? Somebody was sleeping? No? <laughs> okay. Uh, what is wrong? Let me go back. What's wrong here? Can somebody point out? This is not accurate. There is something wrong, fundamentally wrong with this representation. Sorry? Go ahead. Last two records? Yeah, that's fine. That's intended, right? So because there is no shipment mapped, it will be null. But he's on the right track. You still want to try? Sorry? No, that was well. Okay, so let O1 plus null, right? So O1 null cannot exist because they have been mapped to shipments. O1, S1, O1, S2 exist. So O1 null is now redundant. And that's where we need to delete. So deletion, again, is a semantic, right? 
Doesn't mean that we are removing it from the data store. You can mark it as delete. It's, I'm not going to, it's a semantic delete. So you now need to delete. How do you identify what is a delete candidate? Let's go back to this, right? So this is the temporal time window. This is what has happened. O1 got mapped to S1. O2 got, O1 again got mapped to S2. So when we have a primary key, which is order shipment, what we do is we look at the second part of it, which is shipment. And we look up wherever shipments have been added. So S1, S2 has been added. Hence, O1 null is a delete candidate. Make sense? Okay. So this is our primary key. This is our delete candidate. So we go ahead and mark it for deletion. With me so far? Do you mind if I repeat this? Do you want me to skip it? Show of hands, how many want, of you want me to repeat this four steps? Take me two minutes. Show of hands, I'll skip that if you don't show your hands. Okay, there's one, few. Okay, awesome, I'll repeat it. Now we are moving into the next 10 minutes. 10, 15, 10, 20, okay? These are the mutations. A new order, O5 has come, mapped to a new picker. Previous three orders have got mapped map to S4, S3, S5 shipments. And wow, two shipments are on the van. They are on their way to your home. We do a left outer join. We get O5. We do an inner join. We get mappings. We get this done. What are the delete candidates here? You want to take a shot? Somebody wants to take a shot? What are the delete candidates? Nobody? I'll cheat and go back to my team. Awesome, yes, yes, yes. So O2 null, O3 null, O4 null, right? That's it, this is the denormalized data model. We apply it, while I, this is where we are at 10.25, right? I know all of us are from a data background and hence data is the only truth that exists in this world, agree? There is no truth out of data. Anybody disagree, show me your hand. We'll meet you outside, no? Awesome. <laughs> yeah, but that's not true, right? There is business logic on data. I'll take a very simple example. Who is deciding which truck should a shipment go on? Some application somewhere, which is aware of how many trucks are available, all of that, right? Do you want the business logic from that system to be there in the data processing system? We avoid that, right? I'll take another example, and this is particularly for scale. How many of you have worked with geo data? Geospatial data, Ravi was talking about it. You know the volumes, he was talking about the volumes, right? If I were to track each and every van, each and every truck, Pan India for Flipkart fulfillment network, the volume of data is huge. And I don't need to know where each truck is every minute of the day. I need to know when I need to know. And hence, we make a case for enrichment. So we have a module which enriches data by querying APIs, right? In this example, if you want to know where the van is currently, you query, you uh, configure this enriched module, it will get you the lang lat long at periodic intervals or all in demand. So you know where your uh, van is. And then you can go to Atlas, plot this, you know where van is. Cool? So this is where we are. Uh, let's do some aggregation on top of this. How many orders have been placed in our system? Four, how many orders picked, how many shipments packed, how many shipments dispatched? And then configure your dashboards the way you want have your data aggregation pipelines, any which way you want, do all the magic. Because you have denormalized data models. Your pipelines can be really fast, your aggregations can be really fast, your visualizations can be really fast, because all of the hard work has been done. Sorry. I made a point about replay, and I said replay is supported out of the box or maybe I'll make that point. Why is replay supported out of the box? I have a question for you. I had three entities. I had pick list, I had shipments, I had vans. What if I get an update on van and my uh, order system is down so I don't know an order has been received? I end up showing incomplete data, right? But remember I made a point about directed acyclic graphs and then there is a sequence of entities, I'll never vis visit that entity because my preceding entity hasn't changed, right? And I'll so the point here is that your iterations are taking care of data as it becomes available. So just because something else has become available before something else should have been, doesn't mean that I'm going to show incorrect data. Because I walk through my graph in a sequential manner. So I'll first visit in orders, and if I don't see any orders, my left outer join will exclude everything beyond that. I see some confused, left outer join will exclude it. If I see orders, I don't see orders, and I see, they'll just be excluded. Uh, inner join will also exclude it because nothing exists. So m my design is taking care of delayed data. My design is taking care of any lag in my pipeline. And when data becomes available in my DAG, 
it will automatically aggress. Because my time window is defined by event received time, not by event generated time. Confused? No. Okay. Some people got it. Awesome. Yes. That's an A3 size paper. That's the DAG of the grocery control tower. Uh, this has since been laminated. It has been framed and it hangs behind Mayank's desk. It sees fresh garlands every day. This is the grocery control tower. This is a live use case. There are multiple such use cases this platform is supporting, right? Multiple services, about eight to 10 today. Uh, 35 entities with 34 joins. How many of you work on stream processing? You realize what this means for stream processing? Somebody does. Anybody else realizes what this means for stream processing? 35 joins, 34 joins, right? 100% um, completeness in 15 minutes, provided data is available. If the source system is down, we are not gods, we cannot do anything. But the data is available, we guarantee 100% completeness. Configuration driven, I don't want to talk about it. I think Ravi did a very good job. Business demands this. That was my trade-off, uh, sorry, that was my algorithm. If any of you have been sleeping, it's time to wake up now because this is the crux of the presentation, right? I'll talk about the different paradigms that exist. I'll talk about batch, I'll talk about stream, and then I'll talk about incremental, I'll contrast them, I'll tell you what to use when, according to us, obviously. So here's, uh, sorry, here's the triangle, right? Uh, and think about it, interpret it this way. If you want low latencies at low cost, you end up compromising on accuracy. So top of the funnel implementation in stream processing. So you want to know how many visitors are coming. You don't need to, to be accurate, right? Millions of users, it's okay if you are 1,000 off. That's where you end up compromising on accuracy. If you want, sorry, uh, if you want high accuracy at low cost, you end up compromising on latencies, batch, right? That's what you do. And throughout all of these, there are always, sorry, product managers who are asking for this. Right? I want it yesterday, I want it yesterday, I want it yesterday. So now with this triangle or this trade-off in mind, uh, let's look at each of the paradigms, right? And this is just my assessment based on my experience. Uh, there is, uh, it's subjective, let me put it this way, right? And we can debate uh, whenever uh, there's time. Batch processing does not give you very high freshness, right, by nature. It looks at data in a bounded manner. It will look at data in a bounded time window. Even if your data is unbounded, it will bound it. It will look at three months of data, and that's it. Anything beyond three months, it doesn't know yet. It will get to know next cycle. Um, and hence, freshness is a constraint. It's the best paradigm for completeness. It will give you accurate data as long as data is there, right? Uh, in terms of affordability, it's fairly affordable, but depending on your volume, it may become a little expensive at you go. Uh, agility, it's okay because uh, it's established, people know how to work with it, so they can go in and uh, use it, right? Um, bulk writes, because uh, they require cheaper disks, once you implement cheaper disks, uh, range queries take longer because your disks are spinning, data volumes are, range queries are going to take longer. Uh, compute can be shared because jobs run one at a time and different can, jobs can share, run on the same compute, right? And they, that's good. Uh, Replace are simple. All you have to do is re-trigger the uh, job. It'll take care of everything. So that's batch for you. Let's move on to stream. Uh, freshness, awesome. You can even do nanoseconds. So there are implementations of complex event processing which are used on trading flows. So awesome in terms of freshness. Uh, completeness, not so good. Because uh, if you look at a point in time, other things may have happened in that point in time which are not available to you. Uh, affordability, Yes, tends to be a little expensive. Uh, agility, it's difficult because the implementations are still maturing. Uh, Flink has matured a lot and then people are learning it and hence people uh, can implement it, but it's still some way to go if I compare it to batch. Uh, record level updates require fast writes, uh, but if you go for fast writes, uh, sorry, if you use cheaper disks, fast writes become a uh, problem. You don't get all the writes available to you. Again, because if you're using cheap disk, range scans become slow. The best thing about this is uh, it's balanced out because uh, compute is again consistently engaged. It has to react to every mutation. It cannot sleep. Any mutation can happen, so it has to be up and listening to all mutations. 
Vplay is complex if you're using the Kappa architecture. If you're using Lambda architecture, it's just not possible, right? Go back to batch, it'll do your replay for you. Let's look at incremental. Uh, biased, because it's ours. Uh, freshness, little bit of a compromise. Minutes, cannot do seconds, uh, tens, five to tens of minutes. Completeness, it guarantees. Affordability, it's not cheap. I'm being honest, I'll tell you why it's not cheap. Uh, Agility, because it's configure driven, configuration driven, all we are doing is joins, right? We are not doing aggregations. All we are doing is joins, and you can abstract that joins uh, into configuration uh, files, and it will take care of it, right? Uh, replication is happening consistently, so it requires fast writes. Uh, joins need fast scans. So what desk am I using? Anybody? SSDs, awesome. So my cost? That's why affordability is a single star, right? Compute can be shared. That's where we balance it. Because we are doing incremental processing, jobs are not consistently running. We can sequence jobs on the same compute, right? So that's where it's balanced. Uh, replace address by design. I touched upon this, right? It's taken care of. Don't have to worry about it at all. So our summary slide, uh, if you want, if your use case is okay with a little bit of a lower accuracy, you want low latency, low cost, go for stream. High accuracy, high latency, low cost, go for batch. If you have some money, you can do, you want high accuracy. Little bit of medium latencies, go for incremental. So my last slide is about when to use incremental processing. Right? And this is what maybe some of you have just been waiting for. Uh, if your time to act is 30 minutes or higher, because incremental processing will happen in a matter of minutes. It cannot happen in seconds. Uh, accuracy is crucial for you. Uh, incremental visibility is acceptable. What this means is that you'll not see data changing as you go along. It will change in windows. Every five minutes, every 10 minutes, make a choice. Uh, multiple systems come together with complex joins, right? And if you combine the last uh, and the first one, it eliminates batch. Batch can take care of complex joins, but it will not give you uh, as good a freshness as we need. And that's where the last one also eliminates stream because it cannot take care of 35 different entities with 34 joints. They have not matured to that state yet. Where should you not use it? I covered that, low infrastructure is a cost. And if you have independent systems, you want to look at a system, uh, just use your transactional database and be done. Query on it, right? Create a slave, be done. You don't have to be joining. So going back to bread, um, there, there are thick slices, there are thin slices, there are medium slices, and all of them is bread. Right? So in our case, all of it is data processing. Right? So we are not here to debate that thick slices are better than thin slices or medium slices and so on and so forth. All we are saying is there are subtle differences. Right? And if you want to make French toast, go with the thick slices. If you are having soup, go with the thin slices, your experience will be better. If you're making sandwiches, go with the medium slices. And our team has done one second. Uh, that's it. Uh, now our team has been able to do such a good job of this. Uh, the business is gung-ho about the dashboards that we have built. They are consuming, they know what's happening all over India with the FIP card supply chain via the dashboards, that we have then decided to kill all the dashboards. Right? We are working on a project which is going to just kill dashboards. No more dashboards. And this is set to release in November, uh, so wait for that time. Meanwhile, if you're going out of this talk and you slept in those 10 minutes window where I requested you to forget everything, right? And as you walk out of this room or you stay for Google's talk, just remember, incremental processing makes great sandwiches. Can you say it? Incremental processing makes great sandwiches. Please, just a speaker is very nervous here. Just help me out. Incremental processing makes Awesome. So that's about it. Uh, I'm open to questions. We have time for questions.
Hello. Uh, so you have, uh, in one of your slides, you have uh, <coughs> mentioned Kappa and Lambda architecture. Yeah. Um, so shall I, uh, like, with whatever understanding I have, it could be wrong, but, but it does incrementally something close to Lambda architecture? No. There are so, no different paradigms. We so, are not requesting you to do stream and then batch. It's just one flow. You don't have to process data twice. So it's actually not close to any of them. It's closer to Kappa because there is no two different paradigms you have to implement, not to Lambda. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, if I make my order as a common business object, so it can be accessible across the picker, dog door, or shipment. So why we need then the uh, order plus shipment, uh, the key to identify this? Uh, because you track each shipment. Your uh, one shipment, because of the uh, uh, economic value, for example, if you're ordering a phone, we may choose to ship it via aeroplanes. And then along with it, if you're ordering a T-shirt, we may just ship it to you via a truck. So they need to be tracked separately. Does that help? But uh, everything primary is the order, right? That order uh, has to be processed and go to the customer. Right. So but that, that should be the common business object. Uh, and can, we can take this offline, but... The primary identifier has to be an order and shipment because it's a one-to-many relationship. And I'm not, this is not a claim I'm making, this is data 101. I mean, the one-to-many relationships, you need to have a primary key which consolidates both sides. I can do the math for you a little later. Yeah. yeah uh, there was a question there. Yeah, yeah, please. This is an amazing talk, so thank you. Um, I, I was just wondering about um, the number of joins you said. When you said 34 joins, are you uh, talking about joins in memory that you have and are they across the same pri uh, keys, uh, primary keys across all the objects that you have or are they kind of different, different keys? So uh, I said there are 35 entities, right? Uh, imagine pairs, right? So pairwise joins is what we do. And then all we care about is the join key between these pairs. Now we do so 35 entities automatically becomes 34 joins, right? And all these 34 joins are getting evaluated in memory, in parallel and getting appended. Uh, as a log compressed and applied, right? And again, the team is here. They can, does that answer your question though? Okay. Uh, anyone else? Uh, so one question regarding the implementation. So Sorry, you, I'm... Uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, so one question regarding the implementation. So when we say batch, Hadoop comes to mind. When we say spring, uh, stream, uh, storm or uh, spark comes to mind. And you, uh, you guys have you, saying that you are using Flink. So how has it been ex experience with Flink and Spark? We are not using Flink. I just took that as an example of stream processing. Okay. So, so what? Intentionally not covered the tech that we use internally, right? I wanted to focus on the paradigm. I wanted to focus on the algorithm. The tech that we have chosen to use, it's like there are our reasons for it. There are constraints at our end or there are benefits at our end, right? For example, Vertica is one of the components that we're using. For us, it makes sense because we already have a license and we can use it. For some of you, it may not. Right. So don't worry about the tech. If you understand the paradigm, you can choose the tech on your own. Right. Does that okay. help? Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Anyone else? There's one there. Yeah, hi. Hey, um, please. Um, since we are following your incremental uh, model, um, uh, say you get the data, uh, you get the orders, and then you ship to the uh, vans. Uh, will there be uh, any cost increase here? Because, say for example, at ten fifteen you get uh, ten orders from Indranagar, and in ten say forty ten forty at ten fifty you get orders from some other place. So, if you wait for some more time, you can get all the orders and put it to one van and send, save the same on that, right? Uh, so are you implying why am I choosing to start processing at a particular point in time? Yes. Uh, so the examples I took were just that examples. Based on your use case, you can configure. You want to process it every two minutes, do it. Or you want to wait for a particular quantum of data to become available, do it. It's an implementation detail. Okay. Okay. okay thank yeah. you. Some other question? So you also talked about replay bit, right? So you're, um, the way I understood it is more in terms of the way you're doing the joins, you can, you can go ahead and uh, avoid any time-based windowing. Is the, my understanding correct? Yes, okay. that's absolutely correct. Okay. Thank, Thank you for articulating it that way. I'll Thank take you. that as a feedback. Yeah. <laughs> 
any other questions okay thank okay. you so last time incremental joins is good for sandwiches that's all you need to remember thank you thank you for not sleeping by the way <laughs>